You're listening to the Viral Molly Podcast Podcast. Now here's your host, Rob, on the mic. Hey, good day, everyone. I'm Rob Espero for the Viral Volley Podcast. We're here in week 14 of the NCAA Division I-2 men's volleyball season. We've got David Hunter Pepperdine, Jay Hosek of George Mason, and Dan, friend of Lewis. This is a continued conversation from our VolleyballMag.com podcast, video interview, whatever you'd like to call it. It's just a bunch of guys chattering about this season that we are so thankful to even have at this point because as we concluded the uh, vir- uh, VolleyballMag.com segment, this time last year, we were discussing like what is going to happen to the future of, of collegiate sports and volleyball for uh, you know our take on things. So uh, with that, I wanted to go into our, we've been doing this COVID scorecard. Unfortunately, we had two liabilities last week. We had two coaches affected by them into, well, one, their final season, a uh, final regular season match and David Hunt and the Pepperdine Waves and Jay Hasek of uh, George Mason in their quarterfinal matchup. So I'll let these gentlemen talk about what happened. We'll start with you this time, Jay. Yeah, Sacred Heart unfortunately had another positive test, and it was at a real unfortunate time for them. They were uh, unable to contract trace uh, the fact that he, whether the kid was involved with everybody or not. And so unfortunately, they had to cancel the match. Uh, you know, they went one in 19 on the season. Um, I know they had some things that they were happy about. They had some good young kids that just got into the program. They're excited about the future. Um, but, you know, we, we liked our chances about coming out of there. And, you know, now, now we get a chance to get after NJIT, which we have not beaten yet this season. Uh, we only played them twice because uh, we had a COVID uh, issue with their team uh, earlier in the year. Uh, so now we get a chance to play them on neutral ground. So uh, that's, that's what happened to us. All right. How about you, Dave? Yeah, ours, there were no new positive cases, which is good. Uh, but maybe some people know, don't know when somebody tests positive, they have to go through their quarantine period, but then they also have to test not only for COVID, but they have to go through a few different tests to make sure that they're healthy to participate with, uh, the rest of the team. So, uh, as we had athletes go through that process, sometimes it takes longer than we would like. So, uh, we couldn't get on the road on Thursday to go play Stanford and, um, it's a bummer. We lost four matches uh, this year because of COVID. But when you take a step back and look at it and have some perspective, you're saying, thank God we got to play a season. So we can uh, deal with four matches with everyone being safe. And and uh, yeah, at the end of the day, we're in Provo. We get to compete at the MPSF tournament. And I think that was the goal. Yep. Yeah, just uh, uh, thinking on the fly here, you know, I believe – only one conference didn't have any kind of cancellation of COVID, and that was the Big West. But they only had ten total, well, ten conference matches, you know, with a few other uh, conference rivals. But they were non-conference matches. Um, what was, I believe, was there anything being done differently, or was there a set protocol across the board across the nation in regards to COVID testing, or, or um, even just quarantine? Because I know Dan, you were affected pretty early on, and you had to you know, miss or reschedule a couple of matches, but uh, what was the difference? Was there a difference in the way teams are doing and, and sports are doing COVID protocols to your knowledge? I believe so. I believe you, if you asked each of us, I think there were some different things going on testing wise. It's the same reason I think when you watch the big West, they don't wear a mask mm-hmm. uh, because I think their testing protocol is even higher than what ours was for sure. And maybe Dave or Jay, you know that. I mean, our testing protocol right now for the tournament is twice a week. Uh, on these single games for the tournament. Before that, it was uh, once a week and PCR stuff. And so that's kind of what the needle was. And I'm not even sure what Conference Carolina was at all in terms of that. Uh, but those guys can speak of their own conferences in terms of what the testing was. So. Yep. Uh, anyone else? Jay, look at your, you had to add in there? Yeah, no, I, I, I got to commend Big West on uh, not having their guys have to wear masks while they're playing. That's yeah, pretty pretty not normal uh, for men's volleyball. You see it in a few women's conferences around the country. And I think there's uh, in the tournament, they're not requiring more masks, but you know, our conference is kind of twofold. We got, we got a couple different members that do different things. Some of them are testing once a week. Some of them are testing, we're testing three times a week. I think Penn state's testing every every day. Uh, And I think that's a big 10 requirement. And obviously we're following a 10 rules. Uh, But you know, the bottom line is it's so hit and miss. It's so there's a lot of luck involved with that. You know, your, your guys 
uh, you know, from the top down, the coach is saying, Hey, we got to make smart decisions. And everybody I think is doing their part. And I think unfortunately once in a while, a guy just gets caught up in something that he didn't plan for, you know, it wasn't like they're running around, you know, with their mouth wide open, trying to <laughs> try to get the virus and testing each other. But the reality is, is, is it, it affected some teams more than none. And that's unfortunate, but you know, luckily we're still playing at this time of year. It hasn't shut anything down. And I think that's the remarkable thing. Gotcha. Anything you had, David? Oh yeah, I, I agree with all that. And then the one that we've experienced is everyone, how they deal with contact tracing. You know, I, I think our university takes the standpoint of if one of your guys that has been in practice in the last two days when they test positive uh, has uh, been in practice, you know, everyone's a close contact to them. And some other universities don't do that. I mean, again, we're just the volleyball coaches. We're just doing what, what we're being told. But um, I think that's also a big variation as well. So you have the, the, the timing of the testing and then the contact tracing and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, I think we're all just trying to, to keep the guys safe and, and uh, move forward with the season. Yeah. <clears throat> well, with that, let's move into what is now the postseason for NCAA Division One two men's volleyball. And we're going to go a little backwards this week. We're going to start on the West Coast uh, with the MPSF tournament. And but wanted to get all your guys' opinions because you've seen these teams, you know their reputations, you know all the athletes. So, but we're going to start in the MPSF with a David Hunt's conference and um, what's going to be happening in Provo, uh, BYU, which Smithfield House hosting these uh, eight teams. And uh, yeah, just go ahead and throw down. Yeah, I mean, the first round matchups, uh, BYU has a bye. And then you got uh, Concordia against UCLA, Stanford, uh, Pepperdine, and then Grand Canyon and USC. So uh, in the Concordia match, it's going to be interesting, you know, for UCLA. How does being up here affect their serving? Concordia, their offense is not real complex. They're going to set Jordan Hoppy and Ray Barsimian, a lot of balls. Uh, I think they're taking a page out of the St. Francis playbook in terms of who they're going to set. The Michael Fisher offense. Um, <laughs> the Michael Fisher <laughs> offense. But, I mean, it's – when you're playing a team like that, you you know where the ball is going, but then you still have to stop them, you know. So, all of a sudden, one of those guys catches fire, and, and it's a long night for you. And UCLA faced that when they played Concordia at Concordia, uh, you know, in February, I think – uh, Jordan got hot from the service line and then that bled over to the offense and they ended up winning in five. So we'll see. And then GCU uh, against USC when they played about a month ago at GCU, it, it wasn't close. And then when they played recently, uh, Camden Gianni didn't play. So I would assume that he's going to play. Um, I think he was dealing with some personal family stuff that, that he was trying to work through. So I would assume that he's going to play. He played a little bit in the last two matches. Yeah. Um, and then our match against Stanford, you know, we're playing a team that potentially it's the last time that they're going to suit up for their university. That's yeah. a tough, that's a tough opponent to face, you know, in terms of uh, how hard they're going to fight and compete. And neither of us have played for, for almost a month. So yeah. as Jay alluded to earlier, you know, who can find the rhythm and get into it. So um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of unknown and everyone's real familiar with each other at this point in the season. Yeah. So, Well, it seems <clears throat> we're seeing a lot of, uh, press for BYU they're getting these phenomenal performances they've kind of cooled off um, and you know as far as picking hot teams they were definitely one of the hot teams in the beginning and definitely your team Pepperdine but obviously with your 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 pause due to COVID protocols these last few weeks yeah. haven't seen a lot but a team to keep an eye on I feel like has been UCLA with Merrick McHenry you got Colt Chuzinski, um and a few other names just the Coburn brothers really stepping up uh what kind of rhythm do you feel teams will have going into this tournament? Yeah, you, BYU, I, you know, everyone is sort of, hey, they're cooling off. They were up 24 to 18 against UCLA in the third set to go up two to one. They had smacked them pretty good the night before. Um, so I still think, you know, if BYU wins that set. My guess is BYU wins in four and, and nobody's saying that they've cooled off. But UCLA, when they went to GCU, they were down 0-2. They put in Kevin Cobrian in opposite, and now they found somebody that, that kills the ball a lot for them on the right. Not that Cole wasn't killing the ball a lot for him, but then moving Cole over to the left, now they have two really physical pins out there, and uh, Champlin was doing a nice job before he got hurt or before he was you know out, but that's a, that's a really physical lineup for him. So yeah. um, they're good, no doubt whoever they throw out there, they have a wealth of talent. Uh, so that's not going to be an issue. It's just 
comes down to they rely so heavily on their serve. Can they can they still execute that at, at the level that they've been doing at home when they come up here? So. All right. Gentlemen, anything else to throw at a coach hunt there? No uh, interaction, no engagement, huh? Just, no, I got some. I, it I is do. spoken. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, Dan. I'll go after you. Yeah, so I, I Pepper and I Stanford match is big. They were supposed to play, and yep. like Dave said, they hadn't played in a month, and uh, now they're going to play at BYU, and so it's like, you know, how do these two teams come out, and how do they respond, and uh, last stand for Stanford, Pepperdine knows that, but probably certainly they want to get out and play just as much as Stanford does, and so I think that's a pretty key one, and, you know, the winner of that, which I'm predicting is Pepperdine, sorry, Stanford, uh, <laughs> I think that's going to be pretty big, Pepperdine and UCLA. Uh, and I think UCLA, I know they won at BYU, and BYU is missing a player, but I don't know. I, I just think uh, I'll pick in Pepperdine to get to the final against BYU. <laughs> I love it. No pressure. So. No pressure, yeah. We haven't played in a month, but, yeah, you go out and beat those two teams. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, But, yeah, and I think GCU um, – I don't know. I think the GCU BYU match will be, be interesting. I think it, it, they at least take a game off them because I think GCU is going to beat SC. Uh, and then that BYU match gets interesting. And do they get hot or find a rhythm and uh, put some pressure on BYU? So, yeah. All right, Jack. Yeah, no, I got to agree. I, UCLA, you know, the fact that they have uh, the one Cobrain setting now, and then you got the Cobrain swing and you got Kaczynski on the outside and you got McHenry in the middle. You know, now you've kept the court 30 feet wide with some guys that can put the ball away at any given moment. That that was a missing piece. I think UCLA was missing for a little bit. It wasn't like they were awful or anything, but I think they're getting some consistency out of those three players. I think Concordia, you know, Dave nailed it on the head. It's the Hoppy, Barsamian show. If those guys are hot, it's going to be a dogfight. But I still think UCLA is going to be the team that will pull out of that one. I think Grand Canyon with Gianni and Janky, if those two guys can start to control the ball a little bit, I know USC is kind of having a down year. But they just, once in a while, they figure a thing out here and there, and all of a sudden they sneak a set out, and all of a sudden everybody starts looking across the net. But, you know, Worley's done such a good job of that program. I think Grand Canyon's going to pull that one out in four. I think Pepperdine's going to beat Stanford. I, I, I'm so sad that Stanford may be suiting up for the last time ever. There's some there's some glimmering hope there uh, that they might come back. Um, but I think Pep's too good for them. I think it's between UCLA, Pepperdine, and BYU. BYU is going to be awfully tough to beat at home. I think Pepperdine and UCLA are the two teams that are going to be fighting for that spot against them. Uh, I, I, I don't want to make any prediction, but I feel that the home team just has such an advantage at Provo and everybody knows it. And it's just, you have to go in there and you got to beat somebody off the net. If it's UCLA against BYU, UCLA has got to serve the snot out of the ball to keep them off the net because otherwise they're going to be a handful and Pepperdine's got a couple of guys that are undersized, but they're really, really good. And, and if they get that chance, they too have to beat the snot out of the ball. And there's a couple of guys that can do it, but man, BYU is just so good at home and that's such a huge advantage for them. So uh, those are the three teams I think are going to come out of the NPSL. Yep. All right. I'm going to take a stab at the big West myself, but you gentlemen are the specialists. So I'm going to have to, or the experts going to have you jump in, but basically Hawaii is hosting a tournament at the simplify Stan Sheriff center arena and uh, it's a mouthful if, if you're a radio guy, but for the most part, Hawaii hosting is a huge advantage for the team. And I, I do believe they're trying to get fans on the inside, but we'll see. Um, Hawaii been playing really well, coming off a, uh, a sweep of my anteaters over the weekend. It took five the first night, and then it was a cakewalk on night number two. But um, teams I see are really battling Long Beach State and uh, UC Santa Barbara, um, you know, Great play out of those teams. Lamp's been changing due to, you know, be it, you know, rest days and so forth, but they're, they're both been able to compete with whatever personal they've had on the floor. Um, you know, Long Beach State, Young has been pretty potent at the pins with Spencer Olivier really coming into his own. And then you have the experienced senior crew of UC Santa Barbara, but you cannot take an eye off of Cal State Northridge. Um, Daniel Wetter, uh, there's center Kyle Merchant, uh, been doing some really good stuff. And, and Chia, their other middle, you know, not looking like a middle, but playing like a middle, you know, he's doing his part and getting his hands on balls and put the ball away, getting some uh, error free uh, nights that's spreading it out for his pins at the outside. And then of course, there's my anteaters, you know, who knows what they're going to come out with, but we know they've got the talent. 
Uh, Francesco Sani as a true freshman had a big uh, weekend against Hawaii. So that's good to see, but I'm going to miss seeing Joel Schneidmiller play. That's one of the athletes that's, that's, you know, you know, super sad to see graduate because he just was the guy that took care of business, you know, didn't celebrate, just let his numbers do the talking. And then there's uh, Kyle McCauley of UC San Diego. Just enjoy watching that kid play. Um, anything can happen if you're a non-Hawaiian team at the Big West tournament in Hawaii, but it's just a, a it's a, it's like going up against King Kong in there on his home turf. So um, that's all I got. Gentlemen, anything to add on the Big West? Well, Rob, I, I think that loss by Long Beach really <clears throat> plays into to a few things, right? That knocked them from second down to third. Is that correct? Yep. So they don't get a bye, right? So now they right. got to play three matches in a row, which in a short season, and it's just, it gets tough. Um, and then I think uh, that Santa Barbara Long Beach match, I think some of these semifinals can can predict if things go as we would all predict or we would all think. I think some of these semifinal matches could determine who's playing into next week and beyond. So yeah. I think that match will be pretty heated. Well, I wanted to ask you guys a question because it's came up on the women's side of the game. I've been catching some of the Twitter, uh, I don't want to say banter, but contributions to the discussion, we'll say. Um, but because of the late night nature and back-to-back -back nature of the tournament, some have been saying that the quality of play has been extremely compromised. I want to get your guys' opinion as coaches. Um, Dan, let's start with you. There's no way it's not. This is recovery wise. You just, it's, I, I think that's the tough thing about both the MPSF and the Big West tournament. Like, and I think Dave hit it. It's like the Long Beach got a pair of mine. First line's good. That could easily go four or five and go to either team or whichever team faces uh, Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara's fresh. Uh, and so I think it's just a tough way of how the tournament had to be put. And it's the same thing you're seeing happen on the women's side a little bit. Just, you know, sometimes the recovery time in these high intense volume matches with the reps that are happening and the intensity and everything that's at stake, both not just physically, but mentally, uh, it's hard to repeat those performances. And you're going to see it happen at the NCAA tournament if everybody's not aware of it. The playing game is on Monday and then the quarterfinals is on Tuesday. And then you got Thursday for a semifinal and a final on Saturday. There is no way seat six, seven is making it. <laughs> Last Thursday. I don't care how, it's just tough. Stanford did it the one time and you saw them get in the final against Loyola in 2014, I believe. And, and Stanford just didn't have any gas left. They were just toast. You know, they played three matches in five days or with their tournament, it was like six matches in 10 days. And so it's tough. And they flew, They that year it was in Provo. They, they played us in the semifinals, beat, uh, or then played BYU in the final and then flew from Provo, I think, to Loyola. You know, so they were on the road and yeah, it's. I agree with Dan. I, it's a shame that uh, you know we're doing it, but I I understand the reason we are doing it, and we made those decisions. But yeah, the NCA one was a little bit disappointing to see that that match wouldn't be over the weekend. That they're gonna have that team or that plan just boom right into it, and then the next night you got to come back and play another tough one. Yep. Yeah. No, I agree. And, and, and any team from the East Coast that goes out and plays Hawaii. I mean, you're playing at 12 a.m. or 1 a.m. depending on the time of year, and that's that's a humongous advantage. I don't care what anybody says. So I think it's um, I, I know the women's programs are complaining a little bit about playing so late, and, and it's unfortunate. But you know, hey, you got a chance to play, and it just is what it is. <laughs> yeah, they've All been right. complaining a lot, right? They didn't like that they went from 64 to 48, but again, they haven't had a tournament canceled, so. Yeah, I feel so bad. Those big ten, yeah, those big ten okay. coaches. Again, complaints, jhossick at gmail.com. You still got your season that was postponed. We got one taken away from us. And you're going to have a second season in three months. Wah. Stop complaining. And that's why we love Jay. I, I just don't get it. You know, I, I don't get it. I, I understand that they're upset about a, a couple of small things here and there. But really, we're going to complain about going from 64 to 48 teams? We're really going to complain about that? When some conferences get seven or eight teams in there every year? I mean, come on. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's get real. We've been, we've been a redheaded stepchild of them for a long time. I have no sympathy. I just don't. Oh, that's offensive to redheaded people. Come on, Jay. Let's not use that. <laughs> it's just a phrase. Don't get, don't get mad at me. Just a phrase. Hey, you can't use that bailout. Oh, it's just a phrase. Come on. It's 2021. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> 
hey, so Rob, I just bet, circle back. You asked about just the, the the recovery time. I think that's what you're yeah. talking. That's why the level of play, uh, maybe a little bit, few more errors, maybe not as clean, maybe not as high, but uh, I don't know. I still watch the matches on the women's, and it's just some pretty good volleyball. And so and maybe it's not, you know, as clean, but I don't know. In the space we're in, they, people just need to quit complaining. That's all we yeah. take playing before being – thankful we're like man we're getting to watch volleyball on tv and they're playing for this and uh i don't know it's the same with the volley talk thread and, and i know we read it but people want to get on there to play more than they do want to talk about hey we're competing and playing and we're finding a way to do this stuff and i, yeah. I think the best thing and the rpi and all the other things it's just like well, yeah everything's different this year we got it but we're just trying to find a way to compete and play and uh, happy for hey, you what we should take it we should take a note from the women's coaches, they complain so much out loud in front of everybody that things got changed, you know, and maybe it's time that men's volleyball started having a voice that started yelling and screaming and saying, Hey, hey stop treating us like we're second class citizens. And, you know, maybe we can get something done. They had enough voices band together to make some kind of noise. It'd be, it'd be uh, something we could take a note from. Well, the movement starts here, huh? We're playing. That is the hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's move through the rest of the conferences here. Um, let's go to the MIVA. Um, you know, one match left, but it's been quite the journey. And, and Dan talked about it up until this point. But uh, what can we see this weekend with that one match remaining? I mean, who are some of the key players? I mean, if you haven't been tracking and you haven't been listening to Viral Volley Podcast or VolleyballMag.com, who are the, key, the, the, the key names in the game this weekend with a battle for Chicago? Is that, is that me going first? You want me that to... would be you going first. <laughs> Let's talk about one thing on the opposite end of the spectrum. So you guys are talking about playing back to back to back. Well, this has been tough, like three weeks of a conference tournament and the downtime and the testing and hoping you're okay as you test again versus part of me wish that we kind of like, oh, well, Thursday, Saturday, and like we normally do it just in the sense of, hey, you know, not so much time in between everything. That's, that's a flip side of that. And rolling the dice every time you test, making sure we're good for three weeks. But <laughs> but as you get into the matches, I, I think Loyola's key pins, you know, they got Cole Schaffhauer and Luke Denton and Colton Brooks and then Garrett Zoli running the show. I think those those are their those are their pieces. They, they dig a lot of balls. Cole's certainly potent it uh, when he's leading that team and attacking and then Luke Denton on the opposite side of that. Those are the two main guys. And then Colton kind of cleans up occasionally. So. Uh, but, you know, we played them at their place last time and you know, and uh, the, we're fortunate enough to get the first match in three, and then the second match was a five-game match. And I, I imagine there's going to be a lot of good volleyball and a lot of dug balls because we both had record high in digs on that second night in that match. Uh, so we're going to have to dig some balls to keep ourselves in a position. And, uh, and then we got our horses that were riding, you know, Coonan and Tyler Mitchum and Kyle Bouget and then T.J. Murray because we haven't <laughs> And then at the same time, Kevin running the show for us on the offensive side. And uh, so certainly uh, if our horses are clicking, I think, I think we get tough and if we're going in a good direction. So. so does a chess match come into play because you've seen each other so many times and are so familiar with each other? Certainly. Or is it just throw your best team out there? No, I think there's, I don't know that we change matchups a ton, but I think there's how you play each other. Uh, I think that's pretty key and how you're lining up and, you know, we have some things we're trying to work on to do a little bit better collectively, no matter who we play. And it certainly uh, will pay off if we're doing that well as a group uh, when we get into the match side of it. Yep. All right. Anything to add on uh, Dan's conference final this uh, weekend? Dave, uh, Dave uh, sorry, Dave or Jay? I didn't say Dave. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I think first of all, we got to give a little kudos to, to Coach Hulse for uh, turning that program around after last year, having, you know, not necessarily the best year for Loyola men's volleyball. Uh, and, and this year, now they're back in the finals of the MIBA. So Mark Holtz, good job. And uh, having, having their center backs old is, is definitely a key piece to that. But, I, you know, with, with that conference rivalry between Lewis and Loyola, there's no love loss between those two teams. And I don't care what the records are. I don't care where it's at. It is going to be an absolute dogfight getting in and out of that thing. Um, I think I think he's absolutely right, though. Schlotthauer and Denton are going to be their two key pieces that are going to need to be hot. They're going to need to be hot uh, in order for that team to be successful. If either one of them has a faulty night and the other one has to carry the load, I'm not sure that Loyola has the pieces around them to be able to handle that. 
Whereas Lewis has got a few more pieces that they can rely on. Should somebody maybe not have a great night, but I tell you what, all bets are off. I, I think Lewis is the favorite. I think all the home teams in the conference playoffs are the favorites. Um, but you know what? I'm watching that match uh, with open eyes. I can't wait to see it. Yep. Dave, anything to add? No, I just, I find it interesting. You know, I think Loyal has been trying to beat Lewis for a while and they just keep taking Dan's assistance or anybody that they can, <laughs> you know, to try to, to try to get an advantage. It hasn't worked yet. So um, I think Loyal is real familiar with uh, all the people on Lewis's team. Yep. Hey, Dan, are you fan free or fan uh, fans this weekend? Uh, so each, uh, I think it's about 70 or 80 per team. Uh, it's about all we could fit in, like, comfortably to not worry about too much stuff. So what they did was it's each of the, like, 15 players each get four, and the three coaches get four, so it's about 72. Uh, so, yeah, that's what we've done each round. I mean, it's been nice. It's been nice to have some family in the stands and gives a little energy to the match. It doesn't take a whole lot in our gym uh, to bring some energy level in terms of just uh, volume, so it's really nice. Yeah. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not – not skip Jay, but talk about the Conference Carolinas because don't want to leave them out. They obviously have their automatic berth in in the form of Belmont Abbey uh, with the big upset of uh, Mount Olive, which you talked about in the volleyballmag.com piece. So congratulations to uh, Belmont Abbey and your your boy, your mad Italian, I think is what you referred to him as. He, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Matteo Maselli. Yes. Yeah, kid had a night. So, uh, you know, congratulations, Belmont Abbey. Uh, they're, they've, they've booked their ticket into the NCAA tournament. So with that, let's jump over to the EIVA, that's Jay's conference. Uh, talk about the happenings there and what we should expect in this semifinal weekend, which is going to be at fill in the blank, Jay. Oh, we'll talk about Penn State St. Francis first. You know, it's, St. Francis went five with them uh, in one of the matches this year. And I, and I think I'm not necessarily – calling an upset by St. Francis. Uh, this just in, by the way, Michael Fisher will have 198 attempts uh, again on that match. Yeah. And, and if they're not setting him that much, um, then they're really, <laughs> they're missing a boat. However, they have a kid named Josh Blair in the middle, 6'4", six, 6'5", six, but jumps a ton and has a cannon for an arm when he gets a hold of it. Uh, he's pretty fun to watch. But, you know, the reality is they've been using a setter that maybe has not been they're starting setter for most of the year. And I don't know why they're not starting Swabinski. Uh, but for the, for whatever reason, they're going with a setter that maybe doesn't have quite the experience level that Roman does. I think Penn state's going to pull this one out in three. I don't think it's going to be a long night for them. Uh, and I think it'll be uh, a, a night where St. Francis will make a couple of good plays. Uh, but I just think Penn state's got too many weapons. And then you get to our match against NJIT. You know, we played them twice earlier this year and we lost uh, in three and in four um, we, uh, you know, we, we just didn't have the right pieces in the right places. We were, we were down a setter for two weeks prior to that. So we were not really able to run a good effective practice that would give us some competition. But the reality is, is it's at a neutral court. And when you're neutral, uh, all bets are off and they have their starting opposite who has been, uh, in quarantine for the last couple of weeks. And I think that that Thursday will be the first day he's played, uh, in two weeks or, or close to it. And, um, you know, NGIT is a very, very good program. We, we mentioned on other program episodes earlier about the impact of foreign players. NGIT is almost all foreign, uh, at least the guys that are playing. You got a German, you got a Spaniard, uh, you've got Puerto Ricans on the team, you've got uh, Brazilians. I mean, you've got guys from everywhere that are coming together and playing really, really good volleyball. I mean, they all, beat USC last year. All threaded together with the setter from New Jersey, by the way. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, but, but you know, last year they beat USC. Last year they beat, uh, they beat Loyola. Uh, you know, they're just a team that's getting better and better every year. And, and got to give a lot of kudos to the EIBA Coach of the Year, Danny Goncalves. He's done a nice job building that program. Yeah, it's just going to be a lot of fun to play them. Uh, hopefully we're at full strength both sides. Uh, and again, on neutral court, I like anybody's chances. Uh, but, you know, again, I go back to home teams going to have some advantages here. You know, when you're on the road this year, you know, you're dealing with COVID and you're dealing with being on the road. You're dealing with a different sleep environment. You're dealing with different sight lines in the gyms. Like, you know, I know players like to say, oh, it's, you know, we just go out and play. It's not that big of a deal. It, it's different. And it's, it's, yeah. it's not necessarily a huge disadvantage. But, you know, the reality is this. It, it's a good conference tournament. I think the right teams are in it this year. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take our chances with everybody else. Yep. 
Well, there we have it. We have our week 14 going to week 15, which is postseason for all of our gentlemen on the screen and uh, as well as the Conference Carolinas and Big West. So uh, good luck, gentlemen, this week. Appreciate your time on the Viral Volley Podcast and VolleyballMag.com. Again, you can watch all of their matches streaming live various places over on the check out the volleyballmag.com streamings and listings or visit their team's websites, schools, websites. It's a big weekend. I mean, the fact that we're having volleyball a year after a breakout of a major pandemic um, and we've made it this far. So, boys, test negative, stay positive and play hard. I'll add that on there. So that's Dave Hunter nice. Pepperdine, Jay Hosick of George Mason, Dan, friend of Lewis, and uh, myself, Rob, on the mic. Hopefully we'll have some from the Big West next week. Uh, I threw a couple lines out there and it came empty. So, <laughs> gentlemen, have a good week and good luck this weekend. Good luck, everybody. Good luck. Hey, y'all. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Viral Volley Podcast podcast. Be sure to follow Rob at Rob on the Mic on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook or at RobOnTheMic.com. Check it next time.